Hello, lovely people. I can't see you anymore. I'm blinded by the light. Okay. Um, hello, everybody. I have the lovely task to give a talk um, after lunch, so I hope nobody falls asleep. I promise I won't, although I can uh, sleep almost anywhere at any time. If you want to be prepared, we are going to actually draw together um, quite a bit. I'm going to give you a little bit of introduction to set the frame of reference and then we are actually going to draw together. So if you want to be super prepared, you should get uh, these little notebooks out of your bags and your favorite pen. So um, you'll be ready in about five minutes when we're going to start the actual talk. All right. Um, this is me. Uh, my name is Eva Lotta Lam. You can find me on uh, social media um, under the name Eva Lottchen. Uh, I studied in Cologne. I'm German. This is the Cologne Cathedral. Um, some Americans um, I heard uh, reference it as, um, yeah, the church opposite McDonald's. It is opposite McDonald's. But um, Work brought me to Paris at some point where I worked for a few years. Then I fell in love with an Englishman uh, and never regretted it, um, which made me move to England at some point. Uh, in 2014, uh, my boyfriend and I um, got rid of our flat and most of our belongings and went traveling for 15 months um, around the world until we were back in Europe. And now, finally, after a bit more than two years of being semi-nomads, we settled again, so now we live in Berlin. So I came kind of full circle after 12 years of not living in Germany. I really enjoyed uh, Chris's talk this morning about traveling and about different cultures and learning uh, about um, different people's uh, perceptions. Um, that's why I want to uh, start by showing you a few of my travel experiences. I love drawing and we're going to talk about sketching and do some sketching. And while we were traveling, I was actually not um, lazy, but I was taking sketch notes of my travels, trying to... Um, collect these little moments um, that you notice that your senses are much more heightened, as um, Chris told us this morning, um, from our travels. So these are just a few impressions. Um, but usually my sketching is more like this, and maybe some of you in the room uh, came to my workshop yesterday. We did a lot of um, sketching interfaces and flows and interactions. So by trade, I'm an interaction designer. Um, so these are some examples of the stuff that I usually draw. Um, I don't only draw on my own, but I draw with other people to figure things out because sketching is also a wonderful tool to collaborate. It is very immediate. Um, and you might have seen um, some of these. Um, I have a terrible memory. I don't know about you, but um, I listen to a lot of wonderful conference talks when I go to events like these, and uh, if I don't take any notes, um, about half a day later, I'm like, oh, there was this amazing talk by this guy, and he talked about something super interesting, but I can't remember what it was. So I take notes um, in a visual form, also referred to as sketch notes sometimes. Um, so I do them at different conferences. Um, sometimes people pay me for it. Sometimes I just do it because I'm interested in it. Um, very rarely I do it in the big format. And if you want to see uh, really beautiful examples of people doing um, graphic recording in the big format, you should pay attention to the ladies in the front here um, who've been doing it uh, so far all day already, and there are a few of these sprinkled uh, around, and they're doing a great job at um, summarizing the talks for us all. Um, last year, I bought an iPad um, with a pencil because I thought I'd um, uh, try sketching digitally as well. I spent quite a bit of time to try avoiding making my sketches look digital, um, which I figured out how to do in Procreate by fiddling about with some of the um, brushes. The great thing about um, sketching digitally is that um, I can go back and look at my process. So uh, some of the software actually records um, what you're drawing and you can play it back as a video afterwards. So it's quite interesting for me to go back and look at my process and see in which order I do things and how I kind of develop visual metaphors and um, 
stuff like that. So of course, this is not real time. This is sped up. Um, this was about a half hour talk. It's also interesting. First, it's a lot of collecting. And in the last third of the talk, the advantage is you can reorganize some of the stuff and move it around a bit once you have a better hang of the overall structure. So um, I still love pen and paper, though, and I use it extensively. You never run out of battery unless you fall asleep yourself. Um, oops. Whoa. Um, I also sketch um, in meetings. Some of the sketches are not as visually rich as my sketch notes because um, I not only have to listen, uh, but I also have to speak to people and engage in a meeting. But it's the same kind of idea of um, visualizing certain things and bringing visual structure um, to a conversation um, that makes it easier for me to process the important points afterwards. Um, I use the same kind of idea when I take notes, um, when I participate in research, um, like when uh, visiting people in their homes, talking to them. Of course, there is um, video recording of all of this, um, hours and hours of video recording, but taking some notes by hand um, actually makes it easier to know exactly where to go in into the video to find the juicy bits again afterwards. And although this is very text heavy because um, I want to capture a lot of actual detail, um, I'm using very simple icons as kind of visual hooks that just makes it very easy to scan the sea of text for, for example, all the positive experiences people talked about or all the problems or all the ideas that I had for things that we could do while they were talking. Um, I help other people to figure out their processes and describe uh, complex processes um, to their customers. Um, so this is an example of uh, a simple sketchable diagram for a quite complex process of um, uh, data analysis uh, that I um, developed for a company. My process for that involves a lot of sketch noting. I talk to different people. I take notes of how they describe their process. and. Um, Sometimes they get up and draw on the whiteboard as well. So I have a lot of these. Um, and then I make some sketches about how this could look like. Um, and then you correct these sketches. You sit down with other people and you say, oh, this is not quite right. You could point at things and say, oh, this might not be the right shape. Or maybe we need an addition um, until you get to the final version. Um, I sketch with other, I teach other people to sketch on whiteboards and invite them uh, to actually express themselves more visually. Um, is this, uh, as I said, an important step in the process of collaborating because everybody can take a pen and contribute to the process. Um, and of course, you can add sticky notes to it. So you can uh, use these diagrams and actually um, develop uh, shared mental models, um, which is an important thing, as uh, Stephen told us this morning as well. Um, I draw when I read books. Um, I take notes from books that way. Um, I sketch <laughs> when I think about things in general, like thinking about sketching. Um, I take notes when I prepare talks like this. Or oh, this was a different talk, but uh, when I prepare a talk, I basically um, make a visual structure of it before I even start making any slides. Um, I sketch when I prepare workshops. This was my preparation for week-long workshops I taught for students in Cologne. So it kind of evolves, but it thinks it's about different visual structures um, and how to put them together in a week. Um, I make myself little visual cheat sheets for the day so I don't forget what to teach the students. Um, I also sketch when I do other things than design or work. Um, I did a yoga teacher training, and I took sketches of um, what I learned there, you know, when your body has to rotate in different ways. And um, a little sketch of it really helps a lot to remember what exactly is going on with each of your muscles and bones. Um, I sketch uh, when I do improvisation theater to kind of remember the different exercises and scores that we are doing. Um, and while we were traveling, I was sketching a lot um, to kind of capture interesting things that I um, learned from making uh, spring rolls in Thailand to um, uh, palm tree baskets in Fiji and uh, how to put on a lungi in southern India. And I teach people how to do this stuff 
and how to use sketching in a lot of different ways. You can see I use it for a lot of things um, because it turns out it is a very good tool for me to structure my own thinking and help structure conversations with other people. So um, I teach, I try to teach this to other people as well because they come up to me and say like, look, um, this is how I take notes or how I kind of externalize my thinking like in linear writing. And um, how, do, how do I get to, the, to, to something like on the right, which is maybe an extreme example because, to be honest, I've been practicing and I've been doing this for almost 10 years now. So um, you will probably not get there in a day, um, but there are actually distinct steps that everybody can take um, that lead you right on the way uh, to being more visual and more uh, spatial in your... Um, note-taking or the externalization of your thinking if it's on a piece of paper for yourself or if it's on a whiteboard with your colleagues. And this is exactly what I would like to do today with you. And because the proof is in the pudding, I brought this magical device here, which is this. Uh, this is my hand. These are uh, pens, so this is live. Um, and we're actually going to... Um, uh, I'm going to talk about the five steps that you can take um, when you start out uh, as somebody who takes notes linearly um, to having more structured and more visual notes. And we're going to actually do that by um, doing it together. So if you would like to um, actually follow along and sketch with me, um, then you will have a fully uh, summarized sketch notes of how to do sketch notes while having practice to do sketch notes at the same time. At least that's the plan. How meta can we get? Let's do this, friends. So, um, something very simple that I sometimes forget myself. It is always good to put some context down before you start doing things. So, um, I'm actually going to put the title of my talk down on this page so I can remember what my talk was called when I look at it in a few weeks. So, my talk is called five steps to change your note-taking. So this goes nicely in the middle uh, on the top of my page. Five steps to change your note-taking. So if you want to sketch along, now is your chance to actually start that process. Okay. Um, here we go. Should I at any point sketch outside of the visual, visual realm because I start um, being uh, excited about drawing and move my paper, shout at me. I'll come back to the box. Okay, five steps to change your note taking. Step number one um, is actually fairly um, simple and it is about how we write. Um, and I want you to change one thing about how you write. Instead of writing in lines, you know, that are long, that go all across the paper, I want you to write in little chunks. So I'm going to write this down. Uh, write in chunks. You could also call it little blocks, you know, not in lines. That is kind of my advice number one. Um, what does that mean? Um, it means, in the English language, it means about, um, by a chunk, I mean about um, two to four words per line. If you are a German speaker like me, um, it could sometimes mean only one word per line, or maybe even only half a word per line, because we are really good at making very, 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 very long words. The Finnish are quite good at that as well. How about the Hungarians? Long? Medium? All right, good. You'll figure it out for your language. So, two to four words per line, uh, rule of thumb for English, but you'll get the idea. You might make neat little blocks. Why do we do neat little blocks instead of lines? Well, the idea is that um, when you write in lines, there are only naturally two things that can be connected to a thought that you put in one line, which is the thought that came immediately before and the thought that came immediately after which is good when you're reading a novel because it is naturally linear. When you're listening to somebody's talk or when you're listening to your own thoughts, um, things are not as linear. More than two things can be connected to a thought and sometimes they don't come in a linear order in time. So um, 
We want to make little chunks so that instead of only having two opportunities, we have 360 degrees of possible connection of thoughts that are related to the initial thought. So the rule of thumb is also about um, what goes into a chunk is about one thought per chunk, one thought. Um, and when a new thought comes, I make a new little block uh, and I put it somewhere when it's related, I put it close to my original one. If it's not that related, I put it somewhere else. So one thought per chunk. And because we want to use this 360 degree possibility of connecting uh, connected ideas, um, actually, and I sometimes have to remind myself because I'm not following my own advice sometimes when I get carried away, um, we want to leave some space around our chunks. So leave some space around your chunks. Um, and this is so that you actually have a possibility to have some space um, to put things um, somewhere when uh, like in 10 minutes something related to this comes up, I still have some space to put it there. Also, it makes it easier to see um, the individual blocks and how they're separated from each other. So a bit of white space, always good. Cool, so this is point number one. This is the first step. If you don't change anything else and just write in little parcels like that, that's already cool. Um, step number two, um, another little thing that I suggest that you could do, and I already cheekily did it while I was doing the first step without telling you, so that's the type of person I am. Um, so I want you to choose the most important word inside of this thought and make it big. Like for example, here it is, I was talking about writing in chunks, which is important, and not in lines. So um, I'm just gonna write it down. Choose the most important, in this case the word important is important in this one, the most important word and make it big. <coughs> make it Actually, big is quite important there as well. Um, so sometimes you can have two important words in one chunk. I would recommend not to have more than two because if everything gets big and important, then nothing is important, you know? You have to have some contrast. But um, what that does actually is um, that it makes my chunks scannable. So when I just scan through these chunks, I just scan through the big words and I see here important and big um, and I have like, the tiny summary of what this piece of information is about. Um, sometimes you might have the problem that naturally in this little mini sentence that you wrote down, there is no word that is the most important word. For example, um, in this one here, we have two to four words per line. I don't know, is words the most important thing? Maybe two to four, but also line. Um, sometimes there's no word that actually summarizes the chunk. In that case, you can just give your chunk a title. So for example, in this one, I could say, the summary of this is actually short lines. That's my summary. Short lines, two to, uh, two to four words per line. Damn, good, I have a summary of that. So I'm gonna write this down as well. So. Um, actually, if there is no keyword, if there is, yeah, you could say that um, these words that you make big, they are the keywords. So if there's no keyword, then give your chunk a title. Here we go, title is important. So I make it big. All right, this is point number two. So um, we are starting to have kind of some structure that is different from just writing in lines, everything in one size. Um, and what we did by pulling out these keywords and making them big, we actually did, uh, already did something which is actually step number three, um, which is uh, where the visual actually comes in uh, properly for the first time. And I'm really excited because that's what sketch noting and um, visual note taking is all about is to add visual hierarchy visual hierarchy, if you're a graphic designer by trade, um, I'm probably not telling you anything new, but visual hierarchy is kind of the ultimate tool of visually making sense of in any information. It is the basis for any graphic design, for any um, information design, for um, uh, interface design, you name it. So 
um, add visual hierarchy. And because visual hierarchy is so freaking important, I'm going to make it actually even bigger. Here we go. I'm going to do some block lettering. I'm going to speed up a little bit. If you are with me and you're actually sketching with me, you don't have to do it uh, in block lettering. You can just write it a little bit bigger and make it stand out. Um, we're getting to this block lettering malarkey in a minute if you want to um, kind of learn that at some point. Visual hierarchy, how do I write it? IE, I think, yeah. I think that's how we write visual hierarchy. So adding visual hierarchy, um, how do I do that? There are a few um, simple ways of doing it, all based in our visual perception. Um, and the first one that I actually already uh, mentioned is uh, by using size. Um, so when I told you to take the most important word and make it big, um, you change the size of it, and by making something bigger, it, is, it stands out more. Making something smaller, it goes more to the background. Um, this is how our world works, you know? The important things that are close to me, they are big. Things at the horizon, really small. I don't have to pay attention to it. Um, the second way I can add visual hierarchy, and I cheekily already did that as well, is by uh, using style. Um, and there are several ways you can use style. Um, the most obvious one, where the style is really different, um, in this one is uh, here where I used um, this kind of hollow block lettering instead of just normal one line writing. So um, block lettering, block letters um, are one way of doing this. Just a little aside, I'm gonna use a different piece of paper just to demonstrate. If you wanted um, to practice block lettering and you don't know where to start, uh, my little tip is I'm gonna use a colored pen. You don't need to use a colored pen, only for demonstration purposes. But if you wanted to um, practice that, um, you start by just writing some nice uppercase letters of the word that you want to um, kind of make in this block lettering. Leave a little bit more space between the um, uh, letters as usual. And now, like this is the skeleton, and now you're putting some flesh onto the skeleton. What a macabre way is Halloween soon, so it's okay metaphor, right? So we're putting some flesh onto skeletons. Um, Tom talking about death all day doesn't help with uh, kind of lightening up <laughs> my mood, so, okay. Um, so you just want to basically outline all the letters that um, you have been doing. What you want to pay attention to is staying equidistant from your skeleton so that you not have any lumps and not have very thin parts. Um, and this is a very good way to train the hand-eye coordination for starting to do this uh, stuff. And at some point, you will just imagine the letters um, without writing them and just uh, starting to outline the imaginary letters in your head. Here we go. I'm imagining there's an E. Can you see the E in front of your mind's eye? I can, and I'm outlining it. So this is the way uh, you can start practicing doing block letters. Um, it takes a bit of practice, but you can actually get pretty um, efficient and fast with it if this is where you want to put your practice. Alrighty. Boom. Here we go. Uh, we did some, so block letters is one way. You could also write in cursive. Uh, the ladies who are doing the big graphic recording, they do some really nice for the titles, you know, some brush lettering, like cursive writing. Uh, cur writing cursive is one way of doing that as well, like this connected writing. Um, if, you, if you search for hand lettering on the internet, lots of inspiration out there. Um, another way I use style as well, which is very simple actually, and I did that before here already. You might have noticed that I actually switch between lowercase and uppercase writing. So um, lowercase versus uppercase um, is a way of doing that as well. And, um, you see that most of my um, keywords, I actually wrote in uppercase and bigger, um, and the filling words uh, of the sentences in between that are not the keywords, I write them in lowercase and smaller. So by doubling up size and style, um, I create even more contrast to make the keywords stand out. Um, but you have to experiment a little bit yourself, what kind of the styles are that you can do quickly and that kind of suit you. Um, these are usually the three things that I do, lowercase, uppercase, and block lettering. That's where, usually where I go back to. Um, so, style is one thing. 
Another thing that we can do um, to create visual hierarchy and make things stand out is using contrast. Um, and when we talk about contrast uh, in the realm of um, lettering or typography, it usually makes, means to make things bold. So um, how can you make things bold? You can cheat by just taking a fatter pen, you know, like a nice Sharpie or something. Having two pens, a thinner one and a fatter one, is super efficient to make things bold. But if you uh, don't have a fat pen, yeah, it's all right. You don't have to start crying or being uh, sad. Um, very easy way to make things bold, also good on a whiteboard where um, you don't have fat um, whiteboard markers, is just doubling up all the strokes that you do. So instead of when you do the B, just doing every stroke once, you just do every, th every stroke twice. And when there's a boring moment in the talk, um, where there's no new information that you want to write down, you can even kind of fill out the middle bits um, and boom, you have a fantastic bold uh, lettering. That works fantastic on a whiteboard as well for titles and things like that. You can even do triple lettering if you want it, uh, triple lining if you want it. More than triple really gets super fat, so um, I wouldn't recommend it, but if you need uh, triple lining, that works as well. And when it gets boring, um, or you're just listening um, to some anecdotes, then you can fill in the in-between parts and you have fantastic fat lettering without a fat pen. All right, contrast. Um, another way of adding visual hierarchy is kind of a special way, a special form of contrast, like kind of the ultimate contrast, and that is, I'm gonna cheat as well because I can, <laughs> uh, is using color. Um, color is actually a super strong way to create visual hierarchy and to, uh, and to grab attention. Um, also uh, comes from our visual perception. Um, uh, we are just hardwired to, uh, to see difference in color. Um, it stands out a lot. And because it is such a strong way uh, of pulling things out, I would um, reserve color for the most important things only that you want to pull out. So, don't use it too dec decoratively, but use it for actually attracting attention to kind of the high level, most important parts. Of course, you can also um, uh, put several of these together. So if I use this block lettering and I actually add color to it, you can see that it will stand out even more because it's one of the most important things I've been talking about so far. Um, so you can layer on different, uh, means of visual hierarchy on top of each other to create new layers. Um, in advertising, they also say if you can't make it big, make it red, because color is super strong. Um, and one last way of creating visual hierarchy is um, to actually use um, some structural elements, so to use um, underlines and frames. I'm gonna write this down, underlines and frames. You might have noticed I already used that before without telling you about it. So um, by underlining all these kind of uh, titles um, uh, of the different parameters of visual hierarchy, um, it becomes, A, it, pu it pulls them together as being on the exact same level, you know, they're all kind of on the same level of the information hierarchy, and also it nicely um, separates them and sets them apart um, from the detail that I might write underneath. So underlining is cool. Of course, you can also underline in a different color that makes it even stronger. Um, and frames is the same thing. Instead of, um, instead of just putting a line underneath, you can, put, uh, you can put a frame around stuff to make it stand out even more. For example, here, title. The frames don't have to be boxes, you know. They can also, uh, they can also be um, clouds, for example. Clouds are quite um, uh, flexible because they t can take on any shape. You can also just um, use ovals. Any kind of um, any kind of container or any kind of frame is totally fine. Um, what I suggest to you is, um, like with all these means of visual hierarchy, you know, there are so many possibilities to mix and match them. Uh, my tip for you is um, experiment, you know, try out what, what suits you, what you like, you know, what you're good at, what you're fast at, what, what creates meaning for you. 
Um, and after experimenting for a while, um, do what designers do, create consistency. So settle on a few kind of styles and a few ways of um, creating visual hierarchy um, that makes sense for you. So it becomes much easier to read your own notes if you're consistent with the way you structure information and the different levels um, of hierarchy. Oh, one thing I wanted to say um, when I was talking about frames and underlines, it's just a little aside, but for some reason people seem to like uh, banners and uh, banners as a particular frame you can put around something. So um, I'm actually going to make a banner out of my title and show you how to do that because somehow people like that. We'll see. Um, so um, I have my title here and if I want to take that into a banner, I put a frame around it. Here we go. I put a frame around it. The good thing is I already wrote out my title. I just, a little side note. Murphy's Law about text in boxes. Always write the text first, because no matter how big you make the box, the text will never fit. You know, you know that when you're an interface designer and you first draw the button, and then you start writing the very long label, and it's like, ah, oh, it doesn't fit. So first the text, then the box. It will always fit. Um, the same is true for speech bubbles. First the speech, then the bubble because otherwise it will never fit. Um, that's why it's called speech bubbles and not bubble speech. So this is just um, a little, uh, a little um, uh, side note that uh, works really well. Um, okay, so when I have my text here, you can also, you could, for example, write your own name if you wanted to put that into a banner or if it's the title. So we have, I have my text, I put the box around it, and the next thing I want to do to turn that into a fancy banner is, um, I uh, put a little Z onto the bottom right corner of that, and then I put another Z inverted on the left-hand corner, like mirrored. Um, now, I want to put a line horizontal parallel to this bottom line that is kind of the same distance as the height of my banner, and then I do that on the other side. And if I was boring, I could just use a vertical line and close that off, but because I'm not boring, um, I put like a little V-shape in there so I have a little fancy finishing. Why not? Um, and to just finish the whole thing off, I finish with a vertical line kind of connecting these open corners um, where this ribbon kind of turns to the back. If I wanted, I could also, you know, put some uh, shading here in the back because that's actually where the ribbon turns to the back and makes some shading, so, yeah. Boom, here we have fancy banners. If you always wanted to impress your colleagues, um, this is one way of doing it. With brilliant thoughts and with fancy banners. These are the two ways I try to impress. Not more. And sleeping through Pantera gigs, maybe. Okay, let's uh, put the little ba banner on here as well because I said I put it on here. Here we go. Cool. We had visual hierarchy. That was step number three. Um, we can actually um, create even more structure in this. Visual hierarchy all already pulls out important points and creates some kind of structure, but if we need even more structure to show which things are connected and, um, and how the flow of this whole kind of line of thought is, um, we can add more structure. So point number, I'll put it here, point number four. Um, we're going to add more structure, add structure. So visual hierarchy is actually creating structure that is inherent in the content. So by writing things in a different way, um, you are creating structure, but um, adding external structure um, is uh, kind of, see? Sometimes it happens that I sketch myself into the corner, so now I don't have enough, um, I don't have enough uh, paper here. This is uh, unfortunate, but it's not a catastrophe because um, I can do several things. I could um, just uh, break the rules of, um, of uh, uh, hyphenating things and do this. I could also have put a little R and a little E here. So I, just to say, don't despair if you sketch yourself in a corner and things don't work out as they should. It's just work around it, you know? Don't freak out. If, if you want to do a nicer version of that afterwards, just redraw it and you have a better idea of where things should fit. 
it's uh, all right. So adding structure. Um, there are basically three ways of adding structure. Um, I can um, connect things that belong together. Um, and I already did that, as you might have noticed. So I can connect things um, by using uh, lines and arrows. Here we go. So you can see I already did that, connecting all these parameters to the visual hierarchy because it makes it much easier to see what connects. Um, so if these are my little chunks of content, here we go. Uh, different ways of connecting things. I could just use a line. Probably a fatter line means uh, it's kind of a stronger connection. Uh, I can use arrows. Arrows usually indicate a direction. One follows to the other. One was there first, or kind of a temporal flow. Um, you could use dotted lines. Dotted lines are great. These are potential connections, or maybe former connections, or connections you might want to think about. So um, again, you can play with different styles of lines and arrows to um, show the connection between things. Um, when I can connect things, I can connect things with these lines, but I can also connect things um, by grouping them. So I can group things um, by using containers. So if there are a few things that um, belong together conceptually, and I want to make it clear that they are actually a group. Um, so if I have my chunks here, um, I can group them by putting a container around them. So these two things belong together and maybe uh, these two things belong together. Again, these containers don't have to be boxes. They can be organic shaped. Again, I, um, I kind of like clouds because clouds are kind of super flexible, you know, they can go around everything. And if I wanted to make it um, clearer that all of these things are point number three and they all belong together, see, I made a cloud around it and immediately, um, it is much easier to see that these things belong together. I could also go and um, make a cloud around my point number one. This is point number one. So I can group these things. Um, by grouping, by putting a container around it, it becomes visually um, just very easy to distinguish things. Um, the cool thing about all these kinds of structural elements is um, that you can put them in afterwards, you know? Usually when you're following somebody else's logic, um, you might not um, kind of uh, understand the structure um, in the beginning, but maybe in the last third of the talk or maybe afterwards. And the cool thing with the structural elements is you can capture first and structure later because all these structural elements are actually even stronger than the visual hierarchy elements that you used here. So, um, even if you just captured content while you were thinking or brainstorming or while you were listening to somebody, um, one, once you understand the structure and see the patterns, you can actually put in these structural elements um, and they will be super visible and super helpful to kind of make sense of the whole. Um, the last structural element actually is there's a third one. When we can connect things, of course, we can also do the opposite. So um, we can separate things. I put a second one here, so separate. I made the arrow too short, damn. Um, I can separate things by using dividers. What is a divider? Um, it is basically the same as a connector, just in a different position. So if these are my chunks, doop, 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 doop. Um, dividers are just, you know, I can say, Here's my divider, and I can immediately say I have three on this side and five things on this side. Of course, you can use all kinds of dividers, you know. There can be subdividers, dotted lines, maybe not as much of a separation. I use these a lot when I kind of ran out of white space and things got a little bit squeezed, and I want to make sure that um, I have a difference between these. Work quite well. All right, that was point number four. And of course, the cool thing is you can go back afterwards and add additional structure um, onto, your, uh, onto your page. So if um, now that I can see that I uh, created some visual hierarchy, um, I actually started writing these um, big points in block lettering, which works super well because it pulls them out, but I only started at point number three. So also retroactively, I can go in and say, okay, 
Um, if I wanted to give the same kind of title to this first one, I would uh, probably write here, use chunks in big, so it becomes super easy to scan when I'm scanning my notes afterwards, that point number one was all about chunks. And for point number two, um, it is all about highlighting the keywords. So um, I write that here. You might notice that I d didn't have any space above next to the number two, um, which is unfortunate, but not a tragedy, because by just writing it in the same style and in proximity to all the chunks about number two, um, it becomes visually apparent that this is actually that this is actually the organizing principle for this block. And if it's not clear enough yet, I could just put um, my container around it to um, to show that it's a group. And last but not least, point number five. You might have noticed that. Um, I was talking about sketch notes, and this was a lot of note and not much sketch, because the sketching actually is not the most important part when you wish, want to visually structure your thinking. Um, but last but not least, we get to it. And the last point I want to mention is to add um, what I call visual anchors. And these visual anchors are actually the little pictures and the little icons um, that you can add to each of your chunks to illustrate them and to make it easier for your eye to kind of hook onto them and find things. Like in the example, like in the example of the research notes, for example, using these little icons. Um, so these are simple images. They are made with simple shapes. So dots, lines, triangles, squares, circles, put together in different ways can go a long way. Um, they guide the eye, and they don't, have to be, um, they don't have to be rocket science. So how do I find an image for something? If I talk about visual anchors, and there's already a noun in there that is an object, like an anchor, I'm going to draw an anchor. Um, so I can start with a line that is connected to a half circle with another little line and another little circle and some arrows at the end. Maybe I just um, put a little uh, rope going through there, and I have an anchor. When I'm talking about a key, I can add a little circle, a line, and a little crown, and I have a key. So I can go through like this, and um, of course, um, for some things I have to find visual metaphors, but um, starting really simple with simple icons um, is, uh, is great because it's just there to attract your eye. So if I'm talking about guiding the eye, I could actually, I could sketch an eye. And if it's about guiding the eye, maybe I could then also, you know, put some lines in there to say, actually, I'm guiding it from spot to spot. Um, so the idea is simple images, guiding the eye. Rule of thumb is about one image per chunk or per main chunk, so that um, for each important piece of information, um, your eye has something to hook onto. So if these are my little chunks, I'll put a different image per chunk. Um, you can also do that afterwards, go through here. So if it's one thought, I could put a thought bubble with a one in there and go through and actually um, add little images and structure afterwards. So, with that, um, I finish my talk because I actually um, showed you all the five steps. Um, how far you go on these, with these steps uh, is kind of uh, your choice. But um, if you want to try it out and if you want to ask me questions about this, um, let me know. Um, this was uh, what I had to share with you. Wow, super cool. You want to see mine? Nice one. Look at this. I like this grouping things with the container. I like the skeleton. I never made a skeleton like that. It's cool. 
Very I, good. This is how I take notes usually, like boring text. So that's the first time I ever did a sketch note. Hey. Anybody else have a, a sketch like that? The first time you've done something like that? Anybody wants to share? Radical. If uh, you want to run up here and just put it underneath <laughs> the camera, come here now. Oh, we have one take. Well, cool. you, well, you asked me a question. Look at this. This is beautiful. Nice. Yay. And an anchor. And an anchor. Oh, we have one more. Thank you. Uh, I wish we had more time for everyone to come up. <laughs> well, you can always take a picture of it, um, put Bravo. it on Twitter, and use the AmuseConf hashtag, because I would love to see your work. Thank you Such so much. Such title banner. That's so cool. Um, <laughs> We're on a super tight schedule, and, yes. and Val is up next. Um, however, there's a, a question that a lot of people want to know. What are the tools of the trade? What do you recommend people who want to do this kind of thing have in their collection to do this well? Any kind of pen. I, uh, usually one black pen and one colored pen is good to create visual hierarchy. Mm -hmm and lots of normal A4 printer paper because it's cheap and cheerful. You can hang it up on the wall. You can throw it away. You don't get precious about it. And the most important thing is just doing it. So the cheaper and um, more available the stuff is, the better. And for people who are really into the digital stuff, what do you recommend tool-wise? Tablets becoming kind of acceptable to sketch on. I'm st I don't, still don't think they're perfect. But um, I'm using an iPad Pro with an Apple Pencil, and I use Procreate. It costs like five euros, this app. I also tested a Wacom Surface tablet. like a, It's a Surface computer if you're into Windows. It works fine as well. It ho also has pressure sensitivity. I don't know. But there's still a way to go to make it really good. <laughs> excellent, excellent. Um, I guess uh, another question is, it seems like you're making the sketch for yourself so that you can sort of recall things. How do you compare this to when you need to kind of show somebody something? Like, do you ever make a sketch for someone else, or is it really just for you? Um, I mean, I think I just made a sketch to show you how to do sketch notes. That is kind of one way yeah, of yeah, doing yeah. it, you know? I use it a lot in my work um, uh, in UX, uh, talking about concepts, drawing diagrams, and drawing structures on the whiteboard, so that the sketch actually becomes, um, it becomes a shared memory of the conversation. And even if the sketch itself is not brilliant, it is, um, you can point to things, and people who were in the room can actually um, recall their memory from the different parts on the diagram because it is a very good um, kind of cartography of the conversation that happened in the room. Got it. Well, another question on that one is, what happens if the meeting is super fast or like it's just kind of chaotic? Is there a time where you're like, yeah, I can't? <laughs> it is. The thing is, um, you get faster the more you practice. Um, with these steps that we've been doing is um, sometimes you don't have time to kind of draw the images or put in the structure immediately, so you capture a lot um, just by writing smaller and bigger in nice chunks and then make sense of the structure in five minutes afterwards and maybe add some uh, of the visual references. And um, so, so that's the nice thing. You can always add layers on top. I see. So you go fast as you can. It's a bit of a mess. And then you kind of go back through and clarify with yeah. the techniques. Yeah. And you get faster with more practice. Mm -hmm. You get quicker. Eva Lada, thank you so much. Thanks for having me.